Chapter 1 The Great Before In the beginning, the great forehead grew five pimples. Two gigantic, two moderately big, and one tiny pimple. The smallest one burst, and out came an old lady who called herself Elizabeth. She remarked at the absurdity of the situation, then noticed the second biggest pimple began to rumble. Out came the monolithic legend known only as Big Chungus. Although Elizabeth was a fellow god of Tier 2, she could not even begin to imagine the scale of this Giga Rabbit. Then, one of the moderately sized but still massive compared to Elizabeth pimples began rumbling. This pimple had birthed a set of twins known as Big Jimmy and Johnny Hotbody. These two would be connected for life, never leaving each other's sight. Big Jimmy also rocked a pair of premium shades that he created while in the pimple. Then, another pimple of around the same size began to eject a massive ball of fat. This would be known as Joe Mama, whose purpose in life is still unknown to this day. Elizabeth became extremely confused at the existence of these gods of Tier 2, but while she was contemplating life, the final largest pimple began to rumble. Everyone looked to see as the pimple exploded into the largest fireworks show to ever happen. This event will go down in history as the Big Bang that created the universe. Chapter 2 The First Life As time went on, these great beings mingled throughout the new universe. 6.9 billion years pass, and Joe Mama gets hit in the head by a planet she was passing by, which enraged her. She then spat on it, and the bacteria in her saliva started the evolution of the first life forms in the universe, excluding the gods. This branch of life over the span of millions and millions and billions of years became a highly advanced civilization, managing to colonize the majority of the star systems in their galaxy, the Dakariata, and even managing to branch off into alternate galaxies throughout their local they became aware of the great beings that have been around for many years before themselves, and formed cults and religions to worship these gods. They became so faithful, in fact, that they dedicated a whole star system to the worship of these great beings, each planet for a different one. The planet societies were peaceful towards each other at first, however the Big Chungus Rabbites so dedicated to Big Chungus that they viewed the worship of any other god as pathetic and disrespectful to Big Chungus and declared war. The war was short-lived however, the other planet's combined forces left the rabbis hopeless. The galactic governing body that controlled the entire colonized galaxy decided the rabbis, as punishment, be banished to an alternate galaxy, one near the edge of their local group known as the Milky Way. To prevent another occurring such as this, the governors decided to put into place an organization that protects all Omega beings from destruction. Not only the original gods, but also future mass influences on the flow of the universe. This organization would be known as the Guardians of the Omega Lords, and would set up bases of operations in every galaxy throughout the universe. Chapter 3 The Evolution of the Rabbites we now set our focus onto perhaps the most important galaxy in the universe, besides the Dakariata, which is the Milky Way. When the Rabbites arrive at this galaxy, they notice no signs of life, which gives them automatic permission to colonize the place. Unfortunately, they do not have the technology that their ancestors used to colonize the Dakariata, so they are forced to stay put on one habitable planet and hope they can build civilization in this new galaxy. However, the vast majority of their population is more interested in worshipping Big Chungus and don't care about advancing in technology. After millennia had passed, the society forgets about the Dakariata and becomes only focused on the praising and worshipping of Big Chungus. Millions of years later, and the race begins evolving longer necks to hopefully become slightly closer to the scale of Big Chungus, and ears to more closely match Big Chungus, the previous horns that they once had shrinking into non existence.
existence. You might say that they looked a bit like purple giraffes, and this is how they remain until their inevitable demise. Chapter 4 The Origin of Shrek We fast forward to 9 billion years after the Big Bang, and we see Big Jimmy and Johnny Hotbody jiggling around the universe. They fly past the Rabbite civilization, and Johnny Hotbody sees them eating some sort of food. He wanted to try it, so he created a planet-sized onion for him to try eating. He took a bite and started crying. Big Jimmy thought the onion was harming Johnny Hotbody, so he yeeted the onion across the galaxy. Once the onion ran out of momentum and settled into the galaxy, a small flake of the onion got drenched in Johnny Hotbody's saliva. This gave the flake immense power, so much so that it became a god of tier 3. The flake began turning green and gaining ogre-like qualities, and it named itself Shrek. Shrek then used his powers to transform Onion Planet into a habitable place full of mystical creatures and oniony goodness. His influence spread far, and he managed to bring life to the Milky Way in a way unseen in years previous. The Guardians of the Omega Lord saw the immense power of Shrek and decided to add him to the list of beings protected by the organization. Chapter 5 The Birth of Earth 1000 years later, Big Jimmy and Johnny Hotbody were jiggling around as usual. Suddenly, Johnny Hotbody started to feel something strange. He had never felt this feeling before, and it was concerning him greatly. Big Jimmy knew what was happening, and he told Johnny Hotbody that the onion he ate a millennia ago had passed through his digestive system and was ready to be released. Johnny clenched hard, and out came a planetary scale ball of turd that Big Jimmy would jokingly call the Birth Planet. Big Jimmy also thought it would be funny if he pissed on it, so out came an ocean of piss to cover the Birth Planet hole. Unknown to him, he had been growing an infection in his bladder, which evolved into a sentient life form called a salmon. This salmon would be considered as a god of tier 3, and had been listening to everything Big Jimmy and Johnny Hotbody were saying. It heard Big Jimmy naming the new planet created by Johnny Hotbody, however misheard and thought he said Earth Planet. When he was released into what he thought was Earth, the salmon split off parts of its body to create more salmon. This began the first life on Earth, and the first salmon became known as the Holy Salmon. Big Jimmy and Johnny Hotbody left the new planet, unknowing to the butterfly effect that had been created. Chapter 6 The Spread of Shrek One planet influenced by Shrek's spread, named Utox-14, had some strange occurrence for the people there. They decided to embrace the naming of their planet, and base their cultures and religions on the Botox. Over time, they slowly evolved to have larger and larger asses, until their entire body was just ours. They developed the technology to levitate, breathe in outer space, and create wormholes that they used to travel across space and abduct innocent people and convert them into the buttocks. Another planet also influenced, Football 88, had a severe cultural split in their civilization. Half of the population believed that the worship of feet was the path forward in their evolution, while the other half thought they should focus more on balls and round objects, saying that since their planet is a ball, it must mean that balls are the true form although a small percentage of the ball lovers thought it meant the male reproductive organ, but they were exiled onto an island. This cultural split caused many wars between the two factions. Everything stayed the same until one guy came up with the crazy idea of combining the two ideas together and created football. Everyone was skeptical at first, given their long history of conflict, 
but eventually everyone realized peace was better than war, so their entire culture was changed to fit around this new football, and they have lived in peace for millions of years. Chapter 7 The Great Tree War We return to Earth 508 million years after its creation, and life is flourishing. Hundreds of different species live in harmony, all faithful to their creator and lord, the Holy Salmon. Unfortunately, this is the day that everything begins to change. One lone seagrass is about to undertake the greatest evolutionary leap since the evolution of seagrass itself. The seagrass has begun sprouting separate branches, transforming its kelpie stem into a more solid bark. It also, after pure coincidence, evolved eyes and a mouth and became fully conscious. It became the first tree. This was not an issue for the sea life at first, it was just another species to add to the ever-growing list. But as more and more trees started sprouting up, they were overcrowding the oceans. After a thousand years, the Holy Salmon decided enough was enough, and declared war on the trees. This would have been an easy battle given the Holy Salmon's power. However, at this point there were billions and billions of trees all over the ocean, and the first tree had grown to an enormous scale, resulting in it gaining much power. The Holy Salmon would need to play smart to win this war. He formed a plan to create these tiny creatures called worms to go underground and remove the tree's roots from the soil, then easily knock them over. The Holy Salmon begin creating hundreds of billions of worms and sending them underground to find a single route to attack. While the Great Tree was busy fighting the war above, they were unknowing of what was going on below. After all of the worms were in position, the Holy Salmon gave the word, and all of the worms began removing the roots from the soil. Without knowing what hit them, all of the trees fell over simultaneously. The Holy Salmon approached the Great Tree and told him he had two choices, either devolve back into seagrass or move to the surface and never return. The Great Tree chose the latter and in one great migration movement, all of the trees rolled up onto every landmass on Earth and peace was once again brought to the planet. The Great Tree, seeing the state of the surface, decided that it was too dark and too cold on the surface, given the lack of any sun, uh, and so the Great Tree decided to install natural light sources all across the planet's surface. Chapter 8, Elizabeth Comes to Earth. The year is 2 billion PS. Sea life has reached every corner of the ocean, and the surface has been covered in lush forests with tree counts in the trillions. Elizabeth, who had been floating around in space contemplating life, arrives near Earth. She was fascinated by this strange planet, and decided to get a closer look. As she got closer, Earth's gravitational pull made her appear like a meteor from the surface and she began burning up in the atmosphere. She eventually crashed, making a small crater into the ground. She unknowingly crashed into the Great Tree and launched a branch of the Great Tree far, far away, which somehow slowly grew a separate conscious, however, a much more degenerate one. Elizabeth got out of the crater and began looking around. She arrived at a seashore saw some sea shells, which for some reason made her invent the concept of capitalism. She then saw a fish poke out of the water, signalling her to follow. Elizabeth entered the sea and was amazed by the beauty of it all. The fish led her through multitudes of ecosystems and environments of sea life in the ocean, and eventually took Elizabeth to a kingdom in the sea. Elizabeth entered the castle and in she found the Holy Sun, who had been chilling for hundreds of millions of years. The Holy Sun greeted Elizabeth and introduced himself as the creator of life on Earth. Elizabeth said she would stay here on Earth, and asked if they would ever go to the surface. The Holy Sun told Elizabeth about the tree war, 
and how land and sea have been separated for over a billion years. Elizabeth thought that a lot can change in that time, and perhaps it was time to unite the two planes. The Holy Southern War, Elizabeth, that if she went any further with this idea, it would mean war. Elizabeth ignored the Holy Summon's warning and swam away back to the surface. She looked around and realised that she had crashed into the great tree when she had came here and attempted to apologise. The great tree told Elizabeth that no apology was needed and how he understood that it was a simple accident. Elizabeth explained to the great tree how she was planning to reunite the surface and the ocean. However, the great tree warned Elizabeth of the unwanted consequences of such a revolution and how the Holy Salmon would not go down without a fight. The great tree said he would not be involved in such a war and Elizabeth left the great tree to begin planning her great revolution. Chapter 9 The War for the Surface Elizabeth knew that if she wanted to start such a movement, she would need willing participants. So, she started slow but intelligent. She knew how large of a following the Holy Salmon had gained over the billion years since the Tree War. However, there were always outliers, outliers she could take advantage of. She noticed the two primary classes of the animal kingdom. Fish, who seemed extremely loyal to the Holy Salmon and would be difficult to convince and the less extreme followers, Amphibians, who would be the primary target for Elizabeth's plans. Slowly, she weeded out the true Salmon deniers, joined whatever resistance group they had formed, and expanded from there. The larger following she gained, the higher chance of winning this war. She travelled all across the vast oceans, gaining the following of almost every Amphibian, until she was ready to start the revolution. Meanwhile, the Holy Salmon was preparing for the inevitable encounter. He warned his legion of pure salmon, salmon who have remained without mutations for the course of their evolution and were treated as higher beings to other salmon breeds, that another war was inevitable and to prepare for anything. He put into place a movement that would halt any salmon denier movement, one which would be unexpected by most and would go down as the Salmon Inquisition. This put a stop to some rebel movements, but Elizabeth was careful to warn her followers to prepare for such a movement, as she was the only person with the capacity to expect the Salmon Inquisition. The Holy Salmon thought they had taken out all rebel organisations that could assist Elizabeth, and while waiting for Elizabeth to come crawling back to him in hope of mercy, the unexpected happened. Elizabeth said the word, and every single one of her amphibian followers began taking out all of the salmon outposts across the globe. Elizabeth, with her army of salmon deniers, charged the capital and took down the legion of pure salmon. The holy salmon found himself cornered by the invaders, and was forced to surrender. What the holy salmon failed to take into account was that Elizabeth was European blood, and they were masters of enslaving natives. Elizabeth told the Holy Salmon they would be allowed to stay in the ocean with their fellow fish, but they would have no business forcing those who wished to come to the surface to stay here. The Holy Salmon agreed to these terms reluctantly, and peace was brought to the planet once again. Elizabeth returned to her, her amphibian army and helped guide the first tetrapod to the surface, an event which would change the fate of this planet forever. Chapter 10 Big Big Chungus Throughout the universe, Big Chungus has been worshipped and praised for as long as there was life to praise him. We have seen how the Rabbites destroyed any chance of their technological advancement for the sake of Big Chungus, and they are not the only civilizations with such dedication. Seeing this, Big Chungus decides to forge the great city of Chungustan and ascend his most loyal followers to live in the city of peace and charm. The most loyal of these followers, a highly trained head priest of the Rabbites, is chosen to be blessed with 1% of a fraction of a molecule 
of one of Big Chungus's brain cells and becomes a god of tier 3 under the name Biggus Omega. Biggus Omega would become the head of the Chungus Church and become praised as a holy being in the Chungus mythos. Big Chungus's effect on the universe is not limited to religion, however. Due to his extraordinary scale of approximately 6.34 times 10 to the power of 9 light years, which the observable universe is only 15 times the size of, his gravitational pull is great enough to affect every piece of matter in the universe to a noticeable degree. In fact, he even increased his gravitational pull to a point where objects move faster than light on their way to reach him. Since what we know as the universe is a fourth dimensional hypersphere, and Big Chungus just so happens to lay at the opposite side of said hypersphere to the Milky Way galaxy, it appears as if everything in the universe is travelling away from us. But what we call dark energy is actually Big Chungus attempting to bring everything into his premises. At the end of time, everything will join together and the universe will become Big Chungus. Chapter 11 The Rise of Dinosaurs Following the integration of the tetrapods and other small insects onto land, the great tree found itself skeptical of Elizabeth's integration into the planet's many ecosystems and wildlife. Elizabeth confronted the great tree and told it there would be nothing to worry about and that she would take care of the surface animals with caution. Many millions of years pass, and throughout this time the course of evolution is gently guided by Elizabeth and her plans for the future. She uses techniques such as selective breeding and a small amount of genetic altering to get the results she was looking for among the species that treated her as God. Elizabeth had interest in crafting the reptiles that inhabit the earth into ferocious beasts that she could tame and ride to her heart's content, so she got to work. The process was a timely one, and she took until around 250 million BCE, but now it was complete, and the first dinosaurs could roam the earth. This era was going strong for almost 200 million years without any sign of stopping. But everything must come to an end eventually, and this ending would be caused by a deep unluck. Far, far into the depths of space lay Joe Mama, continuing to have no good purpose other than random mishaps. Out of pure coincidence, an asteroid bounced off Joe Mama and began hurdling in a direct collision course with Earth. Around 65 million BCE, the asteroid struck Earth, leaving the planet in ruin. This asteroid happened to contain 69.420% lead, which was dispersed into the atmosphere, poisoning all creatures that would ever live on Earth moving forward. Elizabeth tried her best to prevent too much damage to her evolutionary process, but the Earth would never truly be the same. Elizabeth was forced to start from scratch. Chapter 12 Monkey is the Universal Form Elizabeth wanted to take a new path for the second attempt at life, and she had big plans. These new creatures would be made to closely resemble herself, and would become masters of the trees. They would create social groups and social structures to be more connected as a group. She got to work, and began forming the first step in this evolutionary process. She made the first mammals. These mammals would eventually spread throughout the continents and replace the dinosaurs as the dominant life on the planet. Still, she was not done. Elizabeth continued selecting mammals close in appearance to herself, until in 55 million BCE, when she managed to get a being closer to herself than ever before. This would be the first primate and the beginning of the period of monk. This period would be the most incredible thing in the history of Earth, and it was the best time to be alive. To be one with the monkey is to be at peace, and peace was all anyone knew. 
Elizabeth was happy with the state of the planet and stopped tampering with the evolutionary path, letting it go its own way. However, Elizabeth was unaware of the atrocities this would cause. Chapter 13 Humanity and the Beginning of the End Fast forward to 2 million BC, and a small genus of ape known as Homo begins evolving. At first, nothing much comes of this, with the Homo erectus and its successors keeping peace with the land. But then we come to 200,000 BC, where a certain species of Homo arises. This is the Homo sapien, or better known as a human. Humans have an innate ability to adapt, and would stop at nothing to get their way. Over the course of thousands of years, they developed the technologies that allow them to take the land as their own, enslaving many other species, as well as some of their own, into doing their dirty work. Elizabeth would be sure to keep a close eye on the species, and make sure they don't do something catastrophic. And so the species advances. They begin to build societies and temples to worship their fabricated gods. A select few realize the true gods, however, and they begin worshipping beings like the Holy Salmon and Big Chungus. However, the majority don't see the truth and continued without them. One day, Elizabeth decides it would be funny if she played into the false religions the humans had invented. So she changes her appearance to that of a young magical man with long hair and a beard and she started claiming that she was the son of the god the humans fabricated. The people were so utterly convinced that they created a whole new system for counting years based off the year Elizabeth claimed she was born. Eventually the people became skeptical and they decided to pin Elizabeth to a cross and leave her to die. Elizabeth played along and after they had placed her body in a tomb she got out and left returning to her elderly form. Around 1,000 years later, and several medieval kingdoms have started to pop up throughout Europe, Elizabeth feels like getting into this new fad, and so she sails off to an island and creates her own kingdom, which she calls Elizabeth Land. Elizabeth will allow her offspring to continue ruling the kingdom without her, choosing to oversee from afar. Slowly, the name for the kingdom evolves through the generations, shortening to England. This kingdom would become one of the most influential on Earth, and many, many events would sprout because of it. Chapter 14 The Alaskan Bullworm It is now 1215 CE, and we turn our attention to a small Native American tribe in North America. These people who were located not far from the fragment of the great tree formed when Elizabeth first came to Earth, lived a modest life. They performed the same traditions, customs, and religious activities commonly practiced by similar tribes in their area. But this would all soon change, as something unusual would rise deep within a cavern nearby. In this cave, a mysterious inter-universal portal appeared from an unknown origin, and out of it came a monstrous being known as the Alaskan Bullworm. This creature would shoot out of the cavern at frightening speeds and begin wreaking havoc on the surrounding area. The native tribe tried fighting back, but it was of no use. Many people died that day, and once the massive worm finally returned through the portal, everyday life would never be the same. The remaining people would see the worm as a punishment from the gods, and they would begin worshipping it, in hope that it wouldn't return any time soon. Through all this, a prophecy emerged, one which stated that in 800 years time, the worm would return to this world and deliver a fury of destruction tenfold what it had previously done. This disaster tale would be passed down generation to generation, scribed on tablets and stone structures to ensure the prophecy never be forgotten. 
people believed that the only way to prevent this catastrophe would be to offer sacrifices to ensure the worm was satisfied enough to have no need to return to the earthly plane. This may have delayed the worm's return by a few years, but there is no stopping the inevitable. Chapter 14 The Birth of Your Mum we fast forward to 1948, where Jo Mama is floating around as usual. She then sees two shiny lights in the near distance and decides to get closer. These lights that Jo Mama found herself attracted to happen to be two neutron stars on a direct collision course, set to make an explosion of massive scale. As the stars spiralled into each other, Jo Mama approached rapidly. When the collision occurred, Jo Mama felt her outie belly button be eradicated and part shot off far away into space. The two biggest of the fragments managed to grow conscious and become beings separate from Jo Mama. The largest, which took up two thirds of the belly button, would become a purple being with incredibly large thighs and would be known as the strange being that is thick. The second, which was much smaller, would become a similar being to that of Jo Mama, taking on another motherly role of your mum. Almost a decade later, in 1957, a scientist named Albert Foz was dealing with a dangerous malfunction of one of his machines. Your mum, who had been floating around in space all these years, suddenly came crashing down to Earth, and with her sheer mass destroyed the malfunctioning machine. Albert, who was attracted to the morbidly obese, instantly fell in love with your mum, and the two lived together in peace. Chapter 16 The Return of the Greats It was just a regular November in 1960. However, what would happen next would be the most unbelievable event since the Earth's creation. Approaching the planet, jiggling as they go, were the great and wondrous Big Jimmy and Johnny Hotbody, who were finally reunited with their planetary creation. The two recognised the planet and wanted to get a closer look at what had happened all this time later. The two had disabled their gravitational attraction, so they didn't need to worry about collision. Unfortunately, what they didn't realise was that the humans had constructed artificial satellites that orbited the Earth at incredible speeds. One which was passing by managed to tear a hole through Big Jimmy's skin, causing him to deflate like a balloon. All of the mass that was once contained inside of him spewed out into the surrounding area, some clumping together to form planetary scale objects we know as Mercury, Venus, the Moon, Mars, Uranus, and the rest contained in the asteroid belt. Johnny Hotbody, feeling much sorrow for what had happened to his brother, decided to anchor himself into the approximate center of the newly formed planets, as well as Earth, and he re-enabled his gravitational pull. Johnny Hotbody began rapidly growing hotter and hotter, transforming into Johnny Hotter Body, then Johnny Even Hotter Body, then Johnny Very Hot Body, then Johnny Extremely Hot Body, and finally Johnny Hottest Body. After this, Johnny Hot Buddy became so unbelievably hot that he ignited into a star that would be known as the Sun, his scale increasing rapidly. All across Earth, people panicked, scientists struggling to figure out what this new object was. The Great Tree realised that the new Sun was a much better source of light and energy than his natural light sources, so he destroyed each one. Jai Mama who was wandering around nearby, saw the commotion and decided to get a closer look. She settled into the gravity of the sun and became what we know now as Jupiter. Meanwhile, what was left of Big Jimmy continued to hurtle down to Earth. Eventually, Big Jimmy crashed into the house of Albert and your mum, which your mum noticed and became enraged. Big Jimmy stood up to see a large ball of fat touching him and so he impulsively shoved your mum into a 5.4 meter deep hole, where she would remain for many, many years. Albert, 
who had been out shopping, returned to find his home destroyed and his wife nowhere to be seen. He looked around and found his first experiment for artificial life, an animatronic bear he named Fetty Fosbear, and asked it what had happened. Fetty told Albert what Big Jimmy did to your mum, and Albert fell into immense sorrow that would last for the rest of his life. Chapter 17 The New Life of Big Jimmy It was the next day, and Big Jimmy had just brought a new pair of shades and a stained white singlet, and he wanted to explore what the humans had to offer. He came across a high jump tournament and decided to give it a try. When it was his go, Big Jimmy did a super mega ultimate jump supreme, which caused him to launch up far into the sky and come crashing back down. However, when he reached the mat, he didn't stop falling. Big Jimmy fell deeper and deeper into the earth until he went so far down that down became up and he passed through the earth's core but nothing could stop his momentum on the other side of the planet people watched as big jimmy shot out of the ground faster than a bullet and he continued to shoot up and up and up he reached space and was now rapidly approaching the newly formed moon. He bounced off it and began rapidly approaching the Earth once again. Eventually, Big Jimmy crashed into a suburban home owned by a female named Sisterly. When the two collided, one thing led to another and Sisterly was impregnated by Big Jimmy. This also caused Sisterly to gain abilities such as shorter pregnancy time, a higher chance for twins, triplets, quadruplets, etc. and to never lose the ability to have children, no matter how old she becomes. Normally, this event would never be the start of a long-lasting relationship. However, it is physically impossible to turn down Big Jimmy and Sisterly instantly fell in love with Big Jimmy's majestic nature as any sane person would. Three months later, in January 1961, their first child was born. Big Jimmy, master of names, decided to name his new daughter Baby Grandma, and the three would live in harmony for many years. Chapter 18 Four years later, Big Jimmy felt like doing some tinkering with some old electronic components. Through a stroke of luck, he accidentally creates the first and greatest video game of all time, which he promptly names Jump Jump. A year later, Albert Foz, in his near insanity, was experimenting creating an artificial child, one which he named Baby Boo. While in construction, Albert wondered if he could create an explosion that would release your mum from the underground. For some reason, he decided to combine the two projects and created a sentient bomb with the mental capacity of a toddler. Obviously, this did not end well and Albert along with nearly all of his technology, was destroyed in an explosion caused by Baby Boo. Fetty Fosbar, who had managed to activate his animatronic mega shield before the explosion, decided he would take care of Baby Boo to make sure she didn't cause any more harm. While this was happening, then From within the core of the sun, what was left of Johnny Hotbody's old body was rapidly ejected out and sent on a collision course with Earth. The return of his brother made it hard to be mad at anything at the time. Big Jimmy, Johnny Hotbody, Sisterly and Baby Grandma returned back to their regular livelihood. Chapter 19 
the Salmon Mafia. In the billions of years since Elizabeth came to Earth, the Holy Salmon had felt itself grow into obscurity. He still had his most loyal Salmon followers by his side, but most of the global population didn't even know he existed. This would have to change. Meanwhile, a small coastal town in Italy, 1972, found their fishing market booming. The people in this town had always had a preference for salmon, but they were open to all types of fish. Everything was great until one day where an invasive species of cod began to invade the native salmon population, which the people of the town were not happy about. When all hope seemed lost, the holy salmon heard the cries of a falling salmon population and rushed into action. The people of the town witnessed as the holy salmon dominated the invasive cod and re-established the salmon population in the surrounding area. The people of the town saw the holy salmon as a sign that salmon was the universal form of life and they formed a cult-like following towards them. Their town would then fall under the control of an organisation known as the Salmon Mafia, which would only accept salmon as their singular food source, limiting supply to their illegal salmon trade, and hard-pressed the population into becoming devoted followers of the Holy Salmon. Years pass, and the High Council of the Salmon Mafia decided to perform an experiment that would hope to transform a person into a salmon. They selected a random peasant for the experiment and began the transformation process. Once the experiment was concluded, it was seen somewhat as a success. However, the technology was destroyed during the process, meaning they would be unable to repeat it. The chosen test subject following the experiment would be seen as a holy being, known as the Holy O. In future years, the Salmon Mafia would spread their influence across the globe, continuing the legacy of the Holy Salmon in the minds of the public. Chapter 20. The Beginning of the Modern Period. It was 1978, and Baby Grandma was growing tired of the ways Big Jimmy and Sisterly were treating her. Once she turned 18 the next year, she left them as soon as she could. Big Jimmy warned her that if she continued down this path, it would lead to no good. She ignored him, and the first thing she did, now she was on her own, was to change her name from Baby Grandma to just Grandma. Shortly after, Big Jimmy decided that his new goal in life would be to have as many children as possible, and he got to work. He named his second child Hilda, and throughout the decades his offspring numbers would enter the hundreds. Sometime in 1982, Big Jimmy discovered the concept of an orphanage, and wanted everything to do with them. He located the nearest orphanage, and began adopting as many children as he could. This would become Big Jimmy's regular routine, one which he would manage with great care. Later, in 1987, Johnny Hotbody decided to do the unthinkable. He wanted to see just how many times he could jiggle in a row, but Big Jimmy warned him that the power of the jiggle was not one to be messed with. He surpassed 12 jiggles, which was equivalent to that of a nuclear explosion. He then, for the first time in history, surpassed 15 jiggles which was previously thought to be the maximum before the fabric of the universe began to shake. Johnny Hotbody, despite all odds, managed to jiggle a total of 19 times, which would become known as the Jiggle of 87. This caused the entire Earth to quake and gave the planet a rotational tilt of 23 degrees and caused the climate to begin a slow, uncontrollable heating process. Meanwhile, in 1988, the fragment of the Great Tree formed when Elizabeth first crashed down to Earth, saw a rare species of hedgehog known as the Ngundi, and got an idea. The tree began crafting these hedgehogs into beings with intelligence similar to itself, 
and they were transformed into the Nganda Knuckles. These creatures would create a fantasy land known as The Way, and develop behaviours such as clicking their tongue and spitting on those who wrong them. The tree, so determined to keep their new pets alive, channeled all their power into forming a spiritual radius around their home, which would allow any deceased individuals to come back to life as spirits. This radius would end up extending to the home of Fetty Fosbear and Baby Boo, which happened to be nearby. Later, in 1993, Elizabeth decides she wants to re-establish her rule of the British throne. Luckily, the current monarch was going by the title Queen Elizabeth II, and was similar to Elizabeth in their general appearance, so there would be little effort needed to convince the public that nothing had changed. That night, she struck, and what was left of the old queen was banished to the even further, never to be seen again. The next morning, Elizabeth woke up into a new role of Queen Elizabeth II, and nobody noticed a thing. Chapter 21 Forehead Man The Great Forehead, after all these wonderful events in his fantastic universe had taken place, he felt he wanted to have a greater physical influence in it. So, in 2008, the Great Forehead decided to create a physical form for himself, which he named Forehead Man, that he would be able to use to interact with the places and people within the Foreheadverse. Although this form is indescribably less powerful than the Great Forehead itself, Forehead Man still manages to be orders of magnitude more powerful than even Big Chunkers. Forehead Man began adventuring around the universe and seeing all the great landmarks there were. He ventured into the Dakariata and helped their great scientists invent time travel, as well as taking a visit to the planetary societies of each Tier 2 god. He went to visit the great city of Chungastan. However, he was met with denial and outrage from the people there as they only accepted Big Chungus as the one true god. Forehead Man then made his way into the Milky Way and went to visit the Rabbites, who had gave him a similar response to the citizens of Chungastan. He landed down to Onion Planet, where he helped one man discover how to turn Wizard Piss into a magical suit that grants the consumer great power. Forehead Man would then travel to his final destination, Earth, where he went to go visit Big Jimmy and the thousands of children he had amassed. Forehead Man decided he would stay on Earth for the time being, acting as a sort of superhero with an alter ego known as Boseph Johnson. With this event, we officially mark the conclusion of the Great Bibble.